All right, what's up, guys? Coming in hot on this one. We are joined by our friends at the Hunting Public. They've been on the podcast a handful of times, otherwise known, maybe more commonly known as THP. People call you guys THP. Uh, we've introed them before, so we're going to save you that. I- introed them individually before with a little right. bio, so we're right. going to save you that. If you want to hear about these guys and their backstories, we're going to encourage you to uh, jump back in time and listen to some of those previous podcasts. Check out their YouTube channel. We'll Check out their link. YouTube channel. Yeah. And all the great things they have going on, because there's a lot of great things. Masters at whitetail hunting, all types of whitetail hunting, all types of terrain, places, states. Correct. If you like to hunt whitetail animals... These are majestic the guys. hot tail animals. <laughs> Darn right. <laughs> that they are. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, the elephant in the room or the boat in the room, it more does, specifically. It has the color of an elephant. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. True. And approximately the size. You guys just name your boat? You just name your boat? Yeah. The elephant. The elephant. Yep. Yeah. Might be bigger than an elephant. <laughs> an elephant. Uh, we're going to talk specifically a little bit today about. Uh, Water tactics, water access, how to use water Mark, for white this isn't, this isn't an average podcast. I feel like you're really downplaying this. This is the first podcast of a pod venture. <laughs> pod venture number two. Pod venture two. Boats episode and one. Bows. Who better to bring on though boats. than guys? <laughs> it's like bows. boats and with bows. I see what you I, yeah, Rick. I picked up on that. We'll bleep that out for <laughs> entertainment purposes. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Eric, Jim, you told me to give her a start. I said clean up. So clean up. What do we got going on here? Well, the, I just wanted to make sure that people did understand that this was this is going to be part of a series. There'll be a lot of other things we're going to be discussing on this, and you're going to follow along in the adventure. But anyway, like you were saying, it, you were going in the right direction. I just want to make sure we pointed that out. Uh, who better to bring on when we're discussing the idea of hunting the north woods of Wisconsin in a boat out of one of the rivers up there. And I don't know, we were just getting pretty heated right before we actually hit record or uh, Ryan cut in this episode about, you know, what Mark was being, was comfortable sharing. I well, think people uh, are going to see some stuff, but, you know. Mark, keep it private, Boardman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, basically we, uh, if you, I don't know if this will be included in the intro, but it essentially it was a mini episode of, hey, that's my spot. Keep it public as long as it ain't my public. Yep. <laughs> Amen. So, um, and and Eric's, uh, Eric's trying to act like he's some altruistic spot giver. Let me let the listeners know that the reason why we're on this river instead of the original river that this boat I'll say is ideal for is because that's my damn spot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Eric. We, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. That's very specific. Easy, You're talking Mark. about burning spots. Hey, that's I'm only sp- hunting this once. Burn I'm, it. Not, I'm not. What if it's <laughs> awesome? Hey, we actually, we literally watched one right, episode of Whitetail Adrenaline last night and found the spot like that. We can go back in and blur out a bunch of stuff. I can't believe you're doing this. Mark. Oh, my the reason why we're going to this river is because Eric didn't want to hunt his spots. Yep. I know. The whole reason of the switching of the river. We're going to talk about scouting that on this Onyx. This boat is perfect this for This podcast is going to involve hey, scouting on Onyx. So, you know what? All right. Okay. Hold, bye. We just got to go. Okay? Stop. Okay. Record. Yeah. You're embarrassing us in front of our friends. Um, Eric, well, Eric's upset me once again. <laughs> All right. Send one ready. <laughs> now, the the guys over here from the hunting public, or THP, they come, they've they come in a little bit cold. We didn't, I don't know, did Eric tell you guys really anything? Very he briefed minimal. us a no. little bit. Okay. Very minimal. All Basically right. what you've already told us. That's what we know. Yeah, we no, had a did. fresh beer last night and got a little, uh, yep. you know, got a little info. Yep. Okay, good deal. So, uh, most of the info I get out of Eric is after a couple beers, too. Yep. <laughs> and um, so, to give you guys a gist, and obviously then the listeners, too, the idea here, Mark has put it so eloquently before, I'm going to try and, and, and essentially preface what you've said in the past, but is find adventure in your own backyard. And so, you know, you guys have hunted whitetail, I mean, left and right. Everybody's you know seen it on YouTube and whatnot. You've been doing it your whole lives. And, um, you know, we thought, why not take something that so many people in this state do and they do it in a great way, and there's no we don't want to say there's a wrong way to do it, but why not just add in as many elements of adventure as we possibly can? And uh, who originally came up with the boat thing? 
I mean, it was just, I think, did we see these guys do it? Uh, you know, I, we've seen on Instagram, you guys have pictures where you got deer in a boat, you guys are doing stuff like that. Yeah, but we got, like, Ted's old boat, and we got kayaks. We don't have a freaking like special this. forces rig <laughs> like this. This is, kind of, this is kind of a Zodiac. Uh, yeah. Again, for those not watching on YouTube, this is an 18-foot inflatable boat that we got from our friends. Uh, maybe they're our friends. I don't know. I'd like them to be our friends. At BoatsToGo.com. They ha- we haven't met them yet. We haven't met them yet. Uh, but originally, we're going to go for a 14-foot raft. Mark whined about it, said we needed an outboard. We went up to a 16-foot inflatable boat with a back-end thing on it you can attach an outboard <laughs> to. They didn't have those in stock, so they upgraded us to the 18-foot yep. uh, at, at a, a small discount or something. I don't remember how it worked. And then Mark got a 25-horse Yamaha from his dad, and now he's all like, I think this is the wrong boat. So now Are you okay. guys going up like the Pacific <laughs> Coast from Washington to Alaska in this it's thing? It's a very small river <laughs> with <laughs> stage two rapids or class two rapids. Yes. Lots of rock. I, th- yes. I, I think there's a little bit of misremembering or, or maybe a no, convenient remembering on this. Because originally I wanted to get super high speed, lightweight pack rafts for this adventure. Yeah, that cost $4,000 a oh, piece. They, no, they don't. They don't. They don't. N- not quite. Not when you know a guy. So, and, and right. Jim... Which everybody who's listening here knows a guy that can get a $4,000 lightweight, flyweight pack raft for whatever. <laughs> as, we're, as we're entering stage four of the longest intro in the history of Sorry, intros... Sorry, guys. <laughs> Jim, I think you touched on a very important thing with this pod venture. And, and, and the premise, the original premise behind it was essentially adventure is where you find it. Adventure can be in your own backyard. I've been wanting to do a trip somewhat like this for probably like five years in the state where I think oftentimes folks think, oh man, if I want to use my high speed backcountry gear, like I got to go west or I have to go somewhere exotic. Alaska. Uh, which is lovely. Uh, but you don't have to. So like in my head, I pictured almost this like moose style backcountry drift, multi-day drift trip where you're hunting new spots every day. You've never been to these spots before, which you guys specialize in doing stuff like that. Yes. And, and just kind of taking the adventure as it comes, maybe have a multi-species approach where it's duck season, it's deer season, obviously you're on water, so you can do some fishing. So that's kind of where, that's the premise behind, I think, this podcast. Right. But to your point from earlier, we do want to talk to you guys about essentially the water tactics. This is something I've never done. I don't know if you guys, Mark, if you, well, maybe some of your Western stuff. Yeah, no, I've never done like a multi-day float style hunt. Okay. Eric. Hunted with these guys out of kayaks and stuff a little okay. bit back in the day, but we never did a multi-day thing. That buck okay. that you shot in October in Iowa, did you kayak in for that one? Yep. Yep. So I thought. So we also were thinking of doing a little bit of onyx scouting here too with these guys, being that you guys have so many times gone into places you've never been before, and then you wind up just figuring it out essentially. And onyx is a huge help in you know mapping software and thing like, things like that that you can see it. From an aerial view, at least, before you go. Yeah. Where, in your opinion, do we start? <laughs> we we got a boat. Whether it's the right boat or not still remains to be seen. Curious to get your guys' thoughts on that as well. I think you've oh. started in the right place with the fact that you're using a, a boat to mm-hmm. access your hunting location. Yeah. I mean, that's you're going to see creative. and get into some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, you yeah. will. Yeah. And... Up there, it's probably not going to be hard to find areas where there's not many people. Correct. You're going to be able to find areas where there's no human scent. Yep. And this is going to allow you to get there. The question I'm thinking of immediately is, can you go up and down this river? Or With the it, outboard, yes. You can. Mm-hmm. Is it hard to go up river? That is the question to be determined well, when we get the biologist. Not if you call. got 25 horses. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 25 so, horses... But the thing that you've been griping about the most, it's a shallow river, mm-hmm. I, so, apparently. With rocks. Okay. A lot of rocks. You can see, so like, for those watching on YouTube, we'll post some of this video here. Just handed the laptop with Onyx over to those guys, and everything you see to the northeast is where we're putting in. The track is mapped out, mapped out on Onyx going to the southwest. The yeah. southwestmost point is our exit. The northeastmost point is our put-in. 
And when you zoom really far in, the imagery shifts over and you can see the rapids and stuff in there. And yeah. from talking and some of the research that we've done, it looks like there's actually like stage two, class two rapids. I don't know how. So you I think there's one. I think there's one class two that looks, you know, a little a little bumpy. I mean, obviously, in something like this, zero worries about that. Um, I was YouTubing some videos of people um, like canoeing the river. So people do canoe the river, but kind of where, and this was post getting this watercraft, uh, there were a couple spots where actually people, you know, grounded their canoes. So yeah, right. the water, you know, hmm. it definitely gets skinny in a few spots where if, it, if those are just, you know, little stretches where we have to get out and, and drag the boat and, you know, lift, lift the motor up, that's, that's fine. But that's... Um, that's just like really the one concern. You sound yeah. remarkably more calm and level-headed about it on this podcast. Is that just like a, pu- a facade? No, it's not a public? facade. I'm saying if we've got <laughs> if we've got like 80 percent of the river that you can right. like run a motor on or just drift com- comfortably, right? Without you know dragging the bottom of the boat, I think I think we're set. That's what's going to make like it an that. adventure. There's the rapids. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. So you guys utilize water then to get into, like you were saying, some spots you otherwise wouldn't be able to get into on foot. Is that is that the primary reason, or is there also? I I feel like I've heard some people say as well, it's almost a bit of a, for lack of a better term, sneak attack in some ways. Oh like yeah, they're not exactly sure. expecting. You know, I think a lot of times it's both, both, both. of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's deer just coming in, and like a lot of the places we hunt, like the deer they seem to bed closer to the river and we, we try to target their bedding anyway. So like you're just popping up right, right where you want to be anyway. Yeah. I mean, okay. A lot of times you're below the river bank on a river like that, at least where we're at and you yeah. just pop right up. Like they don't even know that you're there. Hmm. They're not used to hunters coming in from that yeah. direction. So you're already catching them off guard. Um, the reason why I asked about the, the water and if you can motor back up it yeah, is because the boat makes these trips like super efficient Mm -hmm. from a scouting standpoint so when you go into a new area like this i'm already marking pins on the way down this river on like some good looking stuff what i think would be good now we're wrong half the time Mm -hmm. more than that but we mark all these pins and the nice thing with the boat is that you can just go do 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 all the way down the river first day yep and the good thing is like you're not leaving any scent along the river because you're in this boat so you can go up and down and you can mark all that stuff i mean if you can't go up very easily then it might not be a bad idea to go all the way down the river the yeah. first day i don't know if you can make it all the way to your oh sure right out, and then come yeah. back up and then oh. and mark all the stuff and then pull out yeah. go back around and then start hunting it man you know? i can tell you that burning a day you know essentially scouting oh yeah that's what we always river do. that that didn't occur to me. Right. That exactly. didn't occur to me either. And I could see how to a lot of people that would be uh, a bit of a scary thing because when you're thinking, you know, we're going to take what? Three or four days? Three or four days. Yeah. yeah. To a lot of people, it's scary because you're thinking to yourself, yeah, hunting oh, days. I don't have mm-hmm. like a whole week out here. Yeah. But what we were just talking about, I think in our, we, we had uh, our episode that came out, why don't we ever talk about bow hunting? Yeah. And, and you, people were saying that sometimes the best bow hunters that you see tending to get the most yep. uh the most wild game and you know stuff like that they're the most patient like and they'll they, just wait yep. it out until just the right yep. moment yeah. in the right spot if you watch like ted shot that real big one in missouri last year the whole first day and the the spot that he ended up killing that or first two days maybe i don't know you were the one that was there Aaron, but they just drove the boat around the entire day they i mean they had their bow in their hand like it was the rut they were right. they were essentially hunting but they were just bouncing around to all these different spots and on, I don't know what it was, the fifth day maybe, Ted yeah. wanted to go back to this spot because it was a spot that they had found what he what he liked as the most sign, and that's the spot that Ted ended up killing that buck. They yeah. went in, scouted it the first day, and like four or five days later, they, we came right back to the same exact spot, and Ted shot that buck. Mm-hmm. Well, that was, you know, that whole hunt, BMAC and the Hush and from Hush was there with us too, mm-hmm. and he actually had a series of really good hunts before Ted's hunt, right? And that was another spot that we scouted that first day. Yep. We basically used the boat to go to seven, eight different spots, and we speed scouted them. We walked in a little bit until we saw the sign that we were looking for, then pinned it, backed out. Okay, and a lot of places we went in, we didn't see the sign we were looking for, burned through it, left check that one off yeah what, what time of year are you guys going 
It's going to be what is it? Late so, September into the very beginning of October. Yeah, okay. we're we're That'll actually good. we're coinciding it with the waterfowl season opener because, sure. like mm-hmm. you guys touched on, we're doing a multi-species type thing with deer being the primary focus, right? Um, so and then small game season will be going exactly. On too. So, like you originally, we thought of going in with no food. Yeah, um, <laughs> but we don't want to starve. <laughs> <laughs> we're not that, that confident. Would, let's that be honest. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, but, it would. Y- yeah, like it, to your point about the time of year, I think it is good because you're beating a lot of people. It's uh-huh. that that time where you're past the rush of opening weekend uh, for for bow season, and you're well before the rut. So, yeah. and I think and, one good one positive thing you could look at about that too is if you guys do find a bunch of sign. Like, I think during during that time of year, like, if you find a bunch of fresh sign, like, the deer are still going to be on that pattern where if it was the rut, I mean, they could be miles and miles away, you know? Yeah, by yeah. the rut, they've left sign all over the place. Right. You know? Yep. Is that just, like, rubs and, like, what, yeah. what's, when you guys are talking about sign, what's the biggest things that you're looking for? Mostly just rubs and scrapes. 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 Rubs and, and scrapes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. For the most part. That's, like, your pre-rut sign that's very scrapes. visible that you can find easily. You can see from a distance. Yeah. Scrapes, I would say, are the easiest to tell, like, how recent that they are. Because, like, right. sometimes the ground will still be wet, and, like, you know it's from the last 24 hours. Like, you can see where they urinated in the scrape and stuff yeah. like that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Have, you, have you guys had any um, success calling that early in the year? Sure. At the, yeah, I think if you're close enough. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like even with uh, the water access thing, I know we've talked about this in the past, but I'm curious like what your thoughts are now that it's you've been doing it for a few years. But I remember when Zach first started messing around with the kayak stuff like years ago, he would always talk about how like, I remember he had this weird encounter with a fox. Like he was, remember he was kayaking down the river, or kayaking on one of the lakes down there. And this fox was on the, the bank just kind of checking him out. It didn't like boogie mm, immediately right. like it would you have that. he came from traditional access so i know you guys have had a lot of experiences like that with deer and other critters like do you what are your thoughts on catching them off guard as far as it, when water they don't access? perceive it as a threat right the same way as they would you know foot traffic coming from the other direction mm-hmm. And huh. is that just because they're that used to yeah. people coming from one way and then it almost throws them off yeah. when you come in the back door guys nobody's Nobody's doing this. Right, right. <laughs> nobody's <laughs> nobody's going to buy one of these things and go down this river this far. Right. Which, you know, it hurts you, it may hurt your confidence that nobody else has done that, but at the same time, think about it from the deer's perspective. Yeah. They're yeah. probably real close to that river yeah. where they're betting. Yeah. Because all the pressure's coming from the outside. Yeah. And that that human sense is just going to drive those deer tighter into that river, especially if they can cross it in places. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, which it sounds like it may not be deep enough in some spots for them not to cross. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I either think way. It, it looks like a river like that. They'll, they could cross yeah. that every Either well, way, it's going to, the boat helps the efficiency. So mm-hmm. in just the most simplest form, you know, I'm marking spots on here that look good. You're just going to be able to bounce from one to right. the next. But that's, and it's super like low Jimmy impact. Saying, well. it's, hard yeah. to, it's hard to get yourself convinced to just spend a full day scouting mm-hmm. right on a three four day hunt i'm, I'm getting nervous even thinking about it now. but <laughs> i mean it will help tr- so much because you will eliminate all of the doubt in mm-hmm. these spots i mean yeah. you you may check 10 spots and three of them may be good you right. know whereas if you were hunting you may have went to the very first spot and set up on the very first piece of sign sit there don't see nothing you just burned a whole hunt in an afternoon and you didn't check the other nine and spots. And the whole time right. you're sitting in that spot, you're wondering if you should be further yeah. down, if there's more sign. Losing yeah. confidence. Yeah. Spot. You're losing confidence. So if you if you scout it all on that first trip through, then you are maximizing yeah. your opportunities for the next couple days. Right. And you can hone in on the best stuff that you found. Right, right. What are, like, you're marking off spots now, for example, on the computer. What What is it that you're looking at off of the river that would determine at least looks like a good spot. Of course, like we said, you can never be a hundred percent certain. Does it differ much from when you're coming in from the land? I mean, what's, what is, what are the biggest things you're looking for? I don't um, think that it does differ much from what you look like, what, what you look at when you're coming in from the land, but like it, it just puts you so much deeper into the public in a lot of these spots. Like all the access is way from the road that's really far away, but and like the deepest point on this stuff is the river because that's what where the border is basically. 
but you're just looking for habitat diversity. Like you can see on the map, wherever it changes colors in a bunch of spots, I think is the easiest way to put it. Like that's where the amount of ha- like the foliage and yeah. t- and mm-hmm. habitat. You got dark colors. green, like green, yep. brown, and yep. okay. Yeah, and you got the hybrid mode on right now, so you yeah. can see the the topo lines on there. Yep. And it looks like there's some. It's not just flat river bottom. Yeah, there's it's some definite topography up yeah, there. Breaks in there, so that'll yep. come into play as well. Yeah, there's all kinds of diversity. And you can also look at how much topography is in the way from typical access, too. If there's a bunch of hills and ditches and stuff like that, you can pretty much assure yourself that during that time of year that people aren't probably getting way back by the river. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and like you guys said, just you're essentially inserting yourself where you want to be. I mean, you're not making that noise coming in. Like you said, you know, know, footsteps and this, that, the other that, that deer are, you know, honed in on. And to your guys' point earlier, as far as, like, the water access and deer perceiving you as a threat, like, even if they see you on on, on the river, I, I think it's like, yeah, people aren't doing that, right? But I think all, everything that's attacked a deer has been on land, right? Right. So I think mentally they're, like, stuff out in the water, just we like, see that's that. not going to hurt me. Yeah. Threat for whatever reason, and in some cases they may... He- be habituated to people using the water for recreation. Right. Yep. Or in some cases, I don't know if it's just the fact that it's, yeah, like they're not getting attacked by predators from the, from the water or if it's just the form of somebody in a kayak. Right. It's less threatening yeah. to uh, sure. or a person, boat. you know, walking. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. or an elephant boat. Well, apparently that is a big thing up there too. I, yeah. I remember the first person we spoke to um, from the DNR said, that if we saw anybody else on the river out there, they'd probably just be out for a kayak ride yeah, looking, at, yeah. looking at the leaves changing yeah. colors or something. And I think that's a good thing. It's just going to yep. lull the deer into thinking like, yep. oh, just another kayaker, you know. Yeah. A false sense of security. <laughs> Espionage. <laughs> another thing that I think almost gets overlooked at sometimes is when you're looking at water access, especially if you're hunting close to, you know, an area where easy, there are rapids. Easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to show them everything. What's that now? <laughs> if, you're, uh, lo- if you're hunting an area near near rapids or anything like that you have water you have background noise oh sure yeah so you're going to be able to cut the motor on this thing go upstream drift back down into it and then you can walk in you have all that background noise covering up any sound that you're going to make going in oh so I think you, there's a lot to be said for that because you can not only come in the back door but you're doing it silently with with almost cover noise rather than yeah. like a cover scent or something like that I think there's something to that as well I do, um, I, I do have a question. So, you know, we're talking about having, you know, a river here or water and, and maybe the same thing applies to, to a, you know, a still water versus moving water. But, you know, you're talking about noise, but are there scent advantages to not, not necessarily just leaving your scent, but with that cooler water being on the river, is it, are things happening that can work to your advantage or are there, are there things happening there with like thermals and, that could work to your disadvantage? Uh, no. I mean, they could sell. It could certainly help you. It, it kind of depends on the individual situation. We've seen that though before. We've set up right next to a river, and the wind follows the path of least resistance. Okay. Right. It just takes the current, basically. It just takes the current of the mm-hmm. of the river, and it will just follow down the channel of the river. And in some cases, you can set up right along the edge of the river and blow a wind where you're never going to get busted. Right. You know, and in this situation, I don't know if you're going to be able to set up right along the edge of the river. You might. You might have to go in half mile. Yeah, right. It, it mm-hmm. just depends on where that terrain break is and where the edge is created yep. within the habitat itself. But as far as as like leaving scent goes, when you leave the boat, we're not necessarily when we're scouting that first day. We're not necessarily going in there to the exact tree that we're going to set up in. Right. We're going in far enough to see the sign we want. And like to Jake's point earlier on on Ted's hunt in Missouri we didn't set up in any trees that we found on the scouting day yeah we just crept in far enough we're like okay big tracks here big scrape here rub here and then we're looking up through the woods and we're seeing big rub big rub big rub 80 yards away another big rub we're like stop that's it because you don't want to put your ground scent all over that stuff we we turn around we walk right back out on the trail that we just came in on straight back to the boat yep and then we go back and when we hunt it we're going in there deeper you know, mm-hmm. to where we anticipate those deer are going to be bedded at. It might only be 100 yards past where those rubs were. It might be 300 yards. Right. We just know that that's just telling us that there's bucks in that area that we're wanting to hunt. Now, that sign. what are you guys usually bringing in as far as, like, for the actual hunt? Are you guys 
mostly like are you committing to the saddle type thing? I mean, we, we had this discussion because right. we have limited space given that we're literally like living out of this boat. Well, for, do we have limited space? Uh, this, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, not anymore. Never mind. <laughs> I mean, some people have apartments smaller than this. Boat. Yeah, very true. <laughs> very true. But like, you know, so we, we had this discussion. You got a climber. We were talking about ground hunting. There's a lot of places here where the topography actually works out where you could set up on a ridge looking down into a swamp edge then you don't even really need a tree stand the saddle thing is always an option like what are your guys's thoughts as far i mean i'm sure you're going to kind of talk about letting the habitat dictate it but what are your thoughts as far as that stuff goes i would say all of the above yeah i mean yeah. I, th- I think the saddle is probably the most versatile mm-hmm. way of, of going in and smallest Light- and most portable small, yeah too, right? yeah footprint <clears throat> small lightweight you can you know, obviously get up into just about any tree, use it that way. Or mm-hmm. if you choose not to, or if you choose to hunt on the ground, you just you don't, you don't have all that bulk. You yeah. don't have the stand. Ted, right. was, Ted was wearing his saddle when he shot that buck on the ground in Missouri last year. He was just wearing it, but we oh, got, really? got down out of the tree. Like we, he just unhooked, we got down quick and went and sat where we yeah. saw the bucks were going. And I mean, huh. he never took it off. That's but sweet. that's a good example of how like both having that versatility, yeah. right? Because they, they were able to get up in the tree. So they had this vantage point. Yep. That's the thing, the advantage that a tree gives you almost always over the ground. Yep. Not in every situation. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times you can get up in a tree and you can see way further. Just, right. you know. Hmm. And they saw those bucks moving, immediately shot down, went over there, set up. Yeah. And they just set up on the ground the second right. time. You know, but see, you're using both methods in conjunction with each other there. Right, you, you, right. They may not have seen that movement had yep, they been on the ground. Be able to adapt. Yeah. Be willing to adapt. And on a short hunt like this, you probably, as soon as you find one thing, get back to it. Like, ditch yep. it, go to where the deer are. Don't worry about blowing them yeah. out of there. I yep. mean, I think mm-hmm. in an ideal world, like he was saying before, if you can get back up river, like you, maybe you just, maybe if you don't go all the way one day, like you just take it in three days, he said, you take it in a third at a time. You just scout a third of the river and whatever right. you feel is best, maybe you make an afternoon set up in there. And like mm-hmm. you're small game hunting the rest of the day and scouting looking for the best sign and wherever you find the best sign then you go back and you guys all sit on your three favorite spots that you right found. right yeah the good thing though is like going back to the efficiency thing and scouting multiple areas it all it gives you a lot of different options but it also enables you to be way more aggressive on a short hunt mm-hmm. like you can go right to the spot and not be afraid because if if a lot of folks are like man i I know that I need to be up there, but I don't want to blow it. You know, I got two more days of this hunt, and I want to keep hunting this area. Yeah. To heck with that. Yeah. You got, if you've already <laughs> scouted, <laughs> yeah. if you've already scouted all these other spots, and you and you have confidence in right. two or three more of them, mm-hmm. then go right in there and set up right where you need to kill them. Yeah, yep. I would put and aggressive in quotes. Like, it's really not that aggressive if you're only going to hunt it one time. I'm like, right. I, I, I should right. say that. But, like, if you're going to only, only hunt it one time, why wouldn't you hunt the best spot? Yep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, and, and That's what I was going to say. Like, one thing I like about this, it's like you almost have no choice but to right. be aggressive. You're like, forced. You're, you're yeah. either you going in or you're not. Much and time. it's fun. It makes it really fun. Yeah. yeah. Like, you have the most confidence that you could have. Like, that, the spot you're most confident, that's where you sit. Well, and like, uh, you know, early season, Mark is still fresh off, and I don't even, I, I hate to mention it, but a, a meat crisis that occurred. And, you know, so yeah. we're just going for, I mean, this is... Brown, it's down. Baby, there we thanks, go. Eric, for <laughs> yes, uh, putting it so eloquently. You I, know, I had if we shoot, I had a catastrophic freezer incident it, a couple of weeks ago. It was bad. Yeah, it happens. Uh, but if we shoot something, you know, on the first day or whatever, you know, and, and we still have waterfowl, we yep. still have small game because that's also another nice thing about the time of year that we're going. You guys right. got room for one more person? <laughs> I think they probably got room for six uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, there's a there's a picture on boats to dot com of a family of like ten <laughs> standing comfortably in this yeah. boat. Gather up Ted, the interns, and bring them all up. Let's do it. <laughs> you need a cameraman. I know yeah. a guy that can run a camera. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> might take like you up blast. on it. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, it does. So, but that that will definitely be to our advantage. It, it takes a little. I mean, there's still going to be the you know some pressure there just to just. I don't know. I don't even know if you should even put pressure on it. We're going to have a ton of fun. 
But right. you know, if you if you go and you don't get the world's biggest buck or something on the first day, you got meat and there's other stuff. You exactly. Can do. Well, there's that, and, and you bringing up the fun. Hunting is always fun, right? But like this trip to me, like this is about having fun. It's about exploring. It's not like, oh man, I got this mm-hmm. pictures of this buck for 19 weeks. And we're gonna go and try and kill this giant. <laughs> yeah, it's like, sorry to tell you guys, we don't have pictures in any of these. Like <laughs> or pictures. Pictures. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, I mean, we got doe tags for this unit. Like yeah, if we, we get a doe, yeah. this is, and even if we don't do. This is just about having fun, and yeah. honestly, like to me, it's like getting back to the core of hunting. It's like yeah. you go because I love it's it. fun. For yeah. sure. How about that Wisconsin bonus doe thing on the DNR's website? When we logged in, fifteen minutes in advance, I was number nineteen thousand eight hundred and seventy in line to get a doe. <laughs> oh, tag. you had the yeah. worst seat in the house. It, yeah, because I had. But a, we still. I, mean, I had a still, sixteen thousand. Yeah, you were at sixteen thousand. <laughs> yeah, Rick, he signed in like at six a.m. and he was number nine thousand. Nine thousand. Yeah. So this this. Uh, basically, Wisconsin breaks down their antlerless tags county by county, and if you're not in one of the the counties that has like unlimited doe tags, you have to buy them on a first come first serve basis. It's a randomized thing. You log in that morning, they shuffle everything up. And yeah, we, there's a there, countdown until 10:30 a.m. Right. They? I I originally wanted to get a Vilas County doe tag to, for gun season up by my dad, logged in, saw number 9,000. Immediately, I'm like, all right, I'm not getting the Violet County tag because there were only 150 of them. So that was one of the first to, su- uh, it was to sell the out. First, it yeah. was the first. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. But uh, an- another question I have for you guys, as far like we were kind of touching on the aggressive thing, on these short stints, do you guys find that you hunt more effectively than you do on, like, if you have the whole season to marry to Greg a spot? and I were talking about this just like a week ago. Like, I'm looking at spots right now in Iowa that we've never hunted before just because I want to go see fresh stuff. It's, yeah. It seems like we hunt better that way just because if you get too familiar with the spot, like, you just get these things in your mind that are, like, things are always changing out there. Like, if you saw a buck do something one time or something like that, you might, t- we tend to overthink stuff right. in, the, in the area that we hunt all the time. I mean, we we use that buck that Zach was yeah. hunting in Iowa open day, opening day last year. He just overthought it. He was using information that he found two, three two years summers, ago. Yeah. Yeah, ago when they were scouting. They saw they bumped bucks in a certain spot during the summer, and that kind of came into his decision-making, yeah. and it basically ended up making a – I mean, they were close. They got within yeah. 60 yards of the deer, but they weren't in the spot that they probably would if have been. If he would have just reacted had they not right. had the that movements that he saw the yeah. night before, he'd have been way better off. Yeah. Hmm. My, my dad is, has an extreme case of that. He missed a buck. I know he's told you guys this story. Back in like 1982, he missed a buck <laughs> on a on an <laughs> island in a swamp, and he still to this day like that is his opening day of gun season spot. 1982, <laughs> like talk about getting married to a freaking spot. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I definitely think like to your guys' point, you can sometimes almost get. <laughs> Hey, this happened once, therefore it yeah. has to happen again. Yeah, well, you can overthink it, and then you know we we hunt in groups oftentimes, and you got two guys overthinking yeah, something, right? Like, yeah, definitely it doesn't cancel each other out uh, usually. <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately, one other uh, f- cool aspect that will be added into this hunt that we didn't mention yet is um, we'll actually be camping. Yep off the off the side of the river, Sweet. and uh, that's not something that you would ordinarily be saying in Wisconsin. It's, you know, not dispersed camping isn't as common as it is in some other places Mm -hmm. uh, around Wisconsin. And we actually found the means to do so. You know, there's there's certain places that you can do it. So depending on on the river system, some will have some you can camp on islands, some you can't camp on islands, some there's BLM that you can find. So we found one that, you know, kind of has a little bit of everything. Yeah. Right. It, basically, it has remote campsites along the river that are accessible only by water. So yep. you can't drive right. up to it. They're a first come, first serve basis. Like we talked with the DNR guy, he said the only competition you're going to have for that is really people doing the whole fall color tour type thing. Kayaking. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, are we really never going to save this place? I, I was wanna, planning I, I was, on it. You were planning on it? Because I was planning That's on why it. That's why. Yeah. Mark's nervous. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's amazing? So here, here's, yeah. and I say this, I say this every single time. I say it every single time. It's not even purely selfish. It's for the other people out there right, right. as well who are using that spot. That out of respect, I think you just need to do your best to provide all the information a person can use, but 
at the same time, let them do some of the legwork right. themselves. That's right. That's how we As go about we it. We face with ours. this dilemma all yep. the time. Yeah. People always ask right. us where we're at, and like the, I basically have a, a message typed up, but like yeah. out of respect for the people that already hunt it, like we don't want to tell everybody where we're at. Yeah, right. I mean, we'll give you the general area. I mean, right. like we'll give you the state, maybe in the, the region, part of the state, and we'll tell you, like, look, there's a bunch of public land up here. Yeah, there's a lot of options. Yeah. People right. always draw Iowa tag, you know, and then message us online every year. You know, like, well, where should I, where should I go? Where's some good public areas in Iowa? Like, yeah. well, we've been on a lot of them, and to be honest, a lot of them are good. Yeah. And some of them were good last year that won't be good this year because right. there'll be people there. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's an ever evolving thing. Yeah. Every once in a while, you find this little gem that nobody knows about, mm -hmm. and you can bank on it and go yeah. in there consistently. But that's very rare. Mm -hmm. Most you, of the time, you yeah. have to do like Jake said, and you have to adapt yeah. 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 to the situation. And I'm less concerned. I mean, like this, I think. The deer density is, uh, this area is not known for deer density. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. right. Like, if we see a deer, I'll be like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Sweet. We saw yeah, one. Definitely. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's definitely places that one could get give up that I think would be way more. Uh, there's public know, land lucrative. everywhere up there, too. Right. There is. It is. It's yeah. pretty, it's actually pretty massive. What are we going to, uh, what I want to know is what are we going to call this? Because I keep like stumbling all over myself trying to figure, you know, because it's, it's just like, the oh, river. It's just the, the river. river hunt. Well, but the what northern gonna, river hunt. Northern I thought it was boats and bows. Boats, boats and bows. bows. Yeah. yeah. The river. The right. river. Anyway. Are you taking this twig? Yes. Yes, that's uh, that's mine. I actually still need to fully learn how to use it. <laughs> Uh, we'll get there. And I don't want to. I don't want one of those stupid compounds. Those things uh, to me, when I look at a compound bow, I just think, blah. <laughs> yeah, that would be way too easy. They just yeah, <laughs> too easy, too complicated, too fancy. Yeah, this is a beautiful looking longbow for those who this aren't yes watching uh, yeah, for, for those for those just listening. This is uh this is the longbow that I'm taking. Uh, it is made by. I'm probably gonna butcher the name. I think it's Tolki. Uh, Tolke, yeah, Tolke, T, I, think. T -O -O, I think it's Tolke, T-O-O-L-K-E, Archery. They're out of Montana, and they make nice. these. Um, it is their Whistler. Ooh. Whistler? That is so the, the beautiful. Whistler. The Whistler. 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 Um, so I got to get, I'm, I'm shooting it with my brother, Dave, lightweight Dave, who's been on here. He got into longbows because they're lightweight. We already mentioned that, I think, in the in the bow hunting podcast we did not long ago. But, um That'll yeah, be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. I honestly, um, I'm not probably going to be proficient enough with it to like really be uh, proficient with it <laughs> 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 by the time we actually go on this hunt. I may very well go out there with judo points and just stump shoot and let uh, these try guys shoot try. some squirrels or rabbits or something or whatever is yeah. legal. Yeah. Shoot some small game with it. Yeah. So I'll be fun either way. That's Definitely. A, that's what's coming. I'd imagine you'll run into some really dumb squirrels being that deep. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, you might be able to get wait. close and like it. I would, I would be ready to shoot squirrels. It'd oh, be yeah. fun. Oh, yeah. Jim like might lots be, of arrows. Jim might be coming home with the only game meat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We get. Yeah. Um, so for the, uh, for the, you know, if you guys are going in on this, knowing there's going to be, we're going to be camping off the riverside. We're going to be doing bow hunting, archery, deer hunting. So the small game stuff, potential for waterfowl. What kind of stuff are you, let's say, loading in your boat? If you guys are going on on your hunt, let's say there's three of us, there's three of you guys, you're headed out. I mean, what are we thinking of taking out there? We're thinking of taking, you know, a cooler. Yeah, that's we're my, gonna going to be my yeah. first thing is a good cooler. Meat care yeah. for, you know, whatever you shoot, especially if you shoot a deer, obviously. You're right, gonna, right. You know, unless you just decide if you shoot a deer, you're going to leave and go take care of it and then come back. But mm -hmm. right. otherwise, if you're going to stay out there, obviously, cooler with ice. Yeah. Yep. The one thing, actually, you know, we're talking about that river and hopefully cooler temps, you know, at least in my experience, it seems like those river bottoms stay a little bit mm -hmm. cooler. So yeah. if we do get a deer, we can, you know, cut it up get and it hang it in, in game yeah. bags, you know, yeah. in the shade it's next to the shade. river. Sure. And I yep. think we ought to be in... Yeah. Okay. Shape that time of year, even if it, it yep. does get a little bit warmer. I think it'll be cold yeah. at night. Game bags so. would be good. Yeah. Probably Cots, won't be very buggy out. Cots, bags, sleeping bags, pillows, yeah. something to get you off the ground. Sleeping pads. We're not Those huge. Nice. We're not good at gear. We just no, no, we, we, we don't just have take, enough money to be good at gear. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of take the minimum amount. And That's right. probably what saddles, we're going to try to do. Saddles will yeah. be pretty sweet to have because yeah. they don't take up a lot of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and you could get up in a tree if you wanted or you can just hunt on the ground yeah. Yeah. if you mm -hmm. wanted to. And you can observe 
like I'm looking at some of the pins you dropped and I know exactly some like what your thought process is on a few of these where you can literally sure. get up eight feet, yeah. observe a hole. There's one right here that I'm looking at. There's two ridges that pinch down. There's a creek and then there's like a swamp, swamp, swamp meadow. Or, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I, I'm sure your thought process there is observe and then attack based on what you. Yeah. Come and up it with. sounds like there's also a lot of habitat types that come there together is. right there. Yeah, for sure. It, it's a, uh, like diverse is an understatement because you, I mean, it, it's, it's primarily big woods. There isn't a lot of crop edge or anything like that really for mo- the majority of this river. Yeah, virtually zero egg. Yeah. But there is a lot, like you can even see sometimes like in, in some sections, there's like areas where maybe wind or there's logging, logging yeah. operations mm-hmm. going on. Cause there's definitely places where trees are knocked down. So are there you, oaks up there? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You'll be able to get in there and start scouting those edges and and see patterns develop. Yeah, you know for that time. Like frame. what? I I mean I couldn't tell you the specific one. I could give you some examples. Yeah, yeah. Like if you were if you were going during late September, early October, say for example, one species of oak was dropping more than the others, and you were mm-hmm. scouting an edge of a swamp where those oaks existed, and they were dropping acorns. Well, you might find a good amount of deer sign there. Go back to on X then at that point, mark that spot and look for a similar spot on down the river and then do 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 okay. on down you go. Okay. Oh. And you you see you're just you're constantly picking up little tidbits every single place that you go. Yeah. That's the great thing, man. When you get on a boat like that and you're going down through there and your goal for that whole day is to shoot some squirrels and scout for deer and you don't have any more expectations, Yeah, like that's all you're focused on. Right. You'd be surprised what you can accomplish with 8 to 12 hours of that. Hmm. And that's all you're thinking about is just taking in as many details as possible, like accessing an area, you know, maybe in that swamp, in that drainage that yeah. you're talking about, there's yep. a low spot where deer tend to cross more than others. Right. You're not going to see that from a map, but when you go in there and walk it, you're going to pick up on those little yeah. things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, even, sp- speaking of swamps... We're bringing waders, right? Is that is that I, the idea? Is that I a, plan on possibly living in my waders at least when we're in the boat. Is that yeah. a good idea? I'd say. Yeah. How cold's the water? Oh, I think she's probably going to be I'm pretty sure. cold. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'd say waders are a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Would you go? Because I know you guys even, use those hip waders a ton. Yeah. yeah. Like even if you like, I'm just thinking too. If, if you guys do shoot something and it runs off in a marsh and you have exactly. to go get it, like you're going to be pretty cold if you don't have those waders. Yep. You got to go mm-hmm. get a deer. Yeah. Well, I guess my thought, too, and I guess, again, it all goes back to, I mean, we don't know what this river looks like, right, as mm-hmm. far as, like, how sure. skinny the water is, yeah. you know, so I don't know, like, That's gonna, if we're going to be getting out of the boat every five minutes. Eric can tell you right mm-hmm. now. Yeah, I actually just uh, looked it up or did the measurement. It's 230 feet. It looks like on about average, so 230. It's about 70 yards. Yeah, 70 yards wide. Yep, yep. 230 feet wide. Man, we can should have an ocean four liner down there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about the wide, guys. I'm not worried about how You're wide this You're worried about the skinny. Let's look at the skinny. Yeah. Can Average you just establish depth. the fact that, and you know, that nautical terms make no sense? Why don't they just call it the front and the back, the yeah. left and the right? And why do they call shallow water skinny? It doesn't make that any sense. That might be a I me thing. Thinking, I don't know. Is that a you thing? I don't think so. It's probably a PNW thing. But every time I say skinny water, you guys automatically go to the width think, of the why river. Why would I right? not think of that? That's what I thought. Thank I didn't you. Know that. Yeah, if, if you went to brought that up, I would have my whole life thinking. <laughs> well, there, there. there's, Mark, there's I'm five, from, there's Mark, I'm from Washington, so <laughs> so oh, bo- my. boat nearing is automatically in my blood. Okay, this, whatever you call it. This <laughs> has to be wrong, but the beep, you know, river, we're not going to say the name. You know, I feel like you get just 70 feet, holes as deep as 100 feet. What? Has this to be wrong. This thing is deep. We're freaking. And there's this and is an there's ocean river. Rapids in there has to be wrong. I I do Are not. You sure like, no, there's seven, more than there's feet? more than one beep river. I think that that might be your problem. Yeah. Did you did you designate river? the fact that oh. it's in Wisconsin? <laughs> yeah. Let's the see. There's a lot of talk going on. Are you make looking me at the Mississippi River? No. Nope. By chance? No. Nope. Right. It's but the I think same. This Mississippi's probably not even that deep. <laughs> yeah. It's deep we'll river. figure it out. Yeah. But that hey, that's it. You know, that's a big thing that. The river conditions, the river depth, and you know how it flows, and yeah. what you're capable of doing right, right. on it with said if boat here. You guys could take like any that's boat. A, what boat? Great would question. It be? Would it be any this boat? boat? Maybe I don't know. Have to see the river. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Let's say you haven't seen the river. Let's say you just kind of plucked this out of thin air, haven't seen the river before. I'd rather have this than any boat we have. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for sure. Feeling more confident. For sure. All yeah. right. But, I mean, up. be prepared to alter your plans. Right. Yeah. You right. go up there after rain or something, I don't know. what. I mean, maybe the water's moving faster than you anticipated and you can't go up river very easily. I mean, who knows? I yeah. mean, you guys have talked to them about what your rig is and no. stuff like that. I'd just do no, that. That's, that's no, that's coming next. Yeah. yeah. We we took step five and just made it step one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. Looking up some images of the river, that seems to be pretty representative of... Looks like a pretty sweet river. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, oh, yeah. Excellent. Mark, yeah, Mark doesn't want us to... Sh- keep oh, it, my gosh, keep, Mark. It's, it's keeping like, it tight to the vest. Oh my yep. goodness. It, it is out it's of like respect. Being a, I am very sensitive to that. It's like being that. in an airport in the security line where you're just sort of like, oh, is that is that an electronic bigger than a cell phone? Yep, on the belt. It's just like you're hyper vigilant. Sound like saying the river's name would be like safety. saying bomb on an airplane. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> From experience? <laughs> <laughs> no. Speaking of sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> on that note... I think that those images look real yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks like real nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that river will work just fine. That's the, that's the hope. And you guys are going late September, you said? Yeah. Yep. Color should be beautiful at that point. It should. Definitely. It really should. It should make for uh, some good scenery. Um, as for, I wanted to ask one thing for you guys, too. So we've kind of alluded to some of the time frames, times of day. And this is uh, one thing I was curious about. So with all the opportunity up there, and, you know, with deer, they tend to be more active, it seems, earlier in the day, later in the day. How do you how do you split that up? What Good do you, question. Like, well, how are, are you going to be going for deer early in the day, and then in the middle of the day you're just kind of looking for squirrels? Squirreling. And then later Scout. in the day you're back at it? or, or Yeah, so what's what's going on there, do you guys think? How would you split it up? That's what I would do. Exactly. That's what I would what do, you just too. Said. Yeah, I mean, you guys are in a cool situation where you can hunt all day. Normally, yeah. like, when we're on trips, we've got a middle of the day is dedicated to editing, editing and yep. social media and stuff like that. So this is okay. This is sweet. Mm-hmm. I would, yeah. Hunt in the morning. Deer in the morning. Hunt small game and scout in the middle of the day, and then you yep. go hunt in the evening. Fantastic. Whilst you're shooting squirrels, you can be planning for the evening hunt. Mm-hmm. You always hear those people that find that their next, like, honey hole, well, you know, rabbit or squirrel, squirrel hunting. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. I think there's something to that. Oh, yeah. Certainly. Just more just time covering out in more, the woods. Covering more ground. Yep. You wouldn't go squirrel hunt the area that you plan to hunt right. that evening and then set up right there. But that seems to be the obvious thing. Just put that I could out honestly see you guys <laughs> getting... But I also could see you guys getting an opportunity at a deer while you're what, squirrel exactly. hunting. So, like, mm-hmm. so I could have a broadhead ready if you Last got a bow with you. in yeah. um, Minnesota, Hayden shot that yep. buck. Like yep. Just walking around. That's Wasn't it like 11.30? And hunting, that was this exact time of year, mid mid late yes. September. Yep. But the conditions were favoring that. Like and and super expand windy on those and conditions. Damp. Okay. Windy, windy and damp. damp. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the deer don't vanish. Right. They're, they're there. Oh, Definitely. They they're there. They don't jump in their spaceship and yep. head off for the for the, the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They don't. They're still there. Mm-hmm. And they st- sometimes are still moving around within the bedding area. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing with damp, windy conditions is you can slip right in there and they don't know anything. They mm-hmm. don't know the difference. You know, and, and it, another point there is if you have those conditions, you know, be super aggressive with your scouting even because you can just, you can get away with so yeah. much more. You can slide in those areas, check them out without risk of bumping stuff. You can literally walk right up on bedded deer if you're doing it right. Did Hayden talk about how he was using the wind that day? Like, was it blowing right in his face? Was he using a crosswind? Cross wind, he was crosswind. crosswind. Yeah. And that buck, when he when he ended up encountering it, when it did it have the wind to its back when it was cruising, or was it... He was just standing up, on where, standing yeah, up. Yeah, okay. where it was bedded pretty much for yeah. the acorns. Yeah. Gotcha. That's he was, interesting. He was on the leeward side of a hill, the buck was. Yep, and, so the downwind side of it. Yeah. Yep. And basically... Hayden's wind was just off from where he shot it. Like if he would have walked much further, the buck would have smelled him. If yeah, mm-hmm. seen the buck. Yeah, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. makes sense. And in this terrain that we got, we can kind of experiment with a lot of those similar tactics. Yeah, that's the cool thing with both sides of the river being public too. Is like yeah. depending on the wind direction, like you can you can pretty much always probably have your wind blowing at the river in some fashion. Yep, exactly. Or away from where you expect the deer to be, I guess. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's an, like you said. I mean, there's there is a fair amount of diversity there. Like you may find just like the one thing, like you said, this oak tree is dropping, and and again, that goes to narrowing down your focus. Yeah, which is nice. So it's kind yep. of like process of elimination, or or just process of finding whatever you think is going to work. But yeah, just picking up on fine details. Yeah, it's, it's just a culmination of all these things. That's how Ted ended up killing that buck in Missouri. You know, it was the the first day of scouting. It is what eventually led to that spot but you guys also hunted the backside of that spot one yep. evening before that so yep. you're just constantly picking up info yeah mm-hmm. about the area during your hunt right which is extremely valuable and in, in figuring out what's going on mm-hmm. right now that's a lot of thing that's something that people overlook it's like, yeah what right. is going on right now because they're going to change mm-hmm. they may do something you were talking about that buck you've been watching out the window of your house yeah like he was bedded up in those beans for right. a week. Yeah, in, week straight, in July. every day. Yep. And then the beans got tall, and like you and said, now last you're not night, seeing him. He's probably laying out in those beans. He's probably not moved very far, but he's not doing. He was doing the exact same thing for five, six days in a row. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, he's, and then he's left, and that's typically how they operate. Right. Yeah. You yep. know, they'll. There's just so many things that are changing in their environment during that time, especially in late summer going into fall. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's interesting. Um, who, I remember a couple years ago too, there was a guy that I believe we talked to from Northern Wisconsin, Northern Minnesota, and he talked about maple leaves as a food source. And that, this actually coincides with that almost perfectly. Like when the maple leaves are really going to be dropping. So they're eating those leaves once they've dropped. Yeah. Like a vacuum cleaner going in there and sucking them No kidding. And you said it's a really short window of time, right? Like it's. Yep. They do the same thing with hedge leaves. Yep. They do it with all kinds of all kinds of stuff out there, but it's very short. Right, right. You know, and I, I even we talked about acorns a little bit the other day um, when the Exodus guys were down. But I've I've been in the woods scouting in late August during a cold front where there was high winds, and there was acorns blowing out of the trees literally that day, like it was the first acorns that had fell of mm-hmm. the fall. Okay. And yep. these are these are bright green, like they are just falling. And within the first hour of scouting that day, we spotted like a bachelor group of eight bucks way back in the timber eating acorns. This and was on just, a summer scouting on a trip. summer sc- I, yeah, scouting I remember trip. That. And wow. the, the same bachelor group we had filmed in a bean Up field on the a week before that, five hundred yep. yards away. So that day, with that cold front blowing those acorns out of those trees, they're back there and they're on them. It's just like that fast is how that transition right works. Yep, man, like it, and that's like a very fine decoy or not decoy detail to pick yeah. up on because mm-hmm. like I'd say traditionally that time of year I'd assume like acorns they're not dropping you know yeah, but right. that like something essentially forced them to drop. Yep, and bam, those deer that you may have been scouting for several days in a row. Like I said, they're not there anymore. Yeah, and see, if you, have an, if you have an October 1st opener, this is August 21st or whatever. If you yeah. have an October 1st opener and you go in there ready to hunt and you go into that acorn flat thinking like, oh, they're going to be on acorns. You get yeah. in there and you're going to see all this sign that's been left. Yeah. But there's no acorns they've, left. There's no acorns left because <laughs> they've been feeding on them for a month and a half at that point. So you've missed your window already. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Like people will go in there and they'll, they'll interpret that sign as it being the spot to be right now. Right. But from what we learned, you know, they were there a month, over a month ago. Yeah. Something you wouldn't have known had you not right. scouted. Mm-hmm. Right. You wouldn't have known why they were there yeah. previously. But uh, after seen. doing that more and more, you understand how quickly these things change. Yeah. That's why the fresh sign is most important. Hmm. And I think oh, that's right. why a lot of people attribute, like, they attribute that to a deer going nocturnal on them, like you're saying. Yeah. They were they were just on beans the week before that, and then, like, some, maybe somebody's watching in a field or getting pictures of bucks, like, a couple times a week. Then all of a sudden, the opener comes around in Wisconsin, and they're like, yeah. oh, they went nocturnal. But, like, really, the acorns probably just started dropping, or they changed their food source yeah. in some fashion. Like, they they probably didn't go far. But yeah. like they're they're not nocturnal. They're not yeah. under the ground, just like laying down for twenty or twelve hours of daylight. Like yeah. they're just yeah. they're just feeding on something else. Probably there was a, a study. I think it was in Missouri. I heard about this on like the Land and Legacy podcast. They had a, a biologist on that had a collared buck or several collared bucks in this area, and 
I think it was like September 1st, that deer was feeding in beans in daylight. And then by the time it got to the their September 15 opener, is that what you guys have in Missouri? September yep. 15th. That buck was still in the beans at like 11 o'clock at night. He was still on his feet at like 6 o'clock, 6.30, but he was over 200 yards deep into the timber. Mm-hmm. So right. still doing the yep. same thing, not dead and gone underground. Still in right. the same area yeah. a lot of times. Yep. Just mm-hmm. slightly moved. Yeah. And, right. and if you're... You're talking about deer. They don't. They don't move very far in daylight right. a lot of the time. So especially a, a mature buck, he's not going to yeah. move very far. So if you're not right there where he wants to be at that particular time, you're and you're just game. in one of the locations that he's been 400 yards away, you're not going to see him. Yep. You might not see any deer. And you might just think, well, this property doesn't have them. But if you would have walked over that ridge into the next habitat break, you might have found them all. Yep. You know. Hmm. They were just pocketed in there and in changing their food source, changing their bedding area. Yeah. Yep. Good thing is, though, is that it's not like it's it's still patternable. Yeah. Like the, when the acorns fall like that, they may feed on them for several weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, if the head or if hedge leaves, if the maple leaves fall. Right. Yep. And you're seeing them blowing out of the trees and then you get in there and you find in some fresh sign where they've been eating those maple leaves. Boom. Set up on it. Yeah. Hunt it. Yep. You know, because that, that pattern will last for a, at least long enough for you to hunt it. Right. Yep. You think uh, think other predators podcast amongst themselves about what their prey, you know, is going to do <laughs> <laughs> all the time? Like our wolves, like, oh, yeah, this farm over here has got yeah. real good sheep, real tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I hope so, too. I was just like I all of a sudden so listening to this, and I was like, wow, we're like predators, and we're just yeah. discussing right now for everybody's entertainment the uh, the prey that we're going to be trying yeah, to do. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. know. The Lion King just came out. I mean, That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. Watch and true. See if they That's do. it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Do a lot of talking there. We watched it last week. Took the boys Did, and yeah. watched it. Yep. It was Excellent. good. Classic. We gotta we gotta make sure we keep you guys in your timeline. I had one more question I know, uh, which was let's say this is kind of getting back to the boat thing, scouting, um, you know, mentioning using your first day to scout the whole river if you can. Uh, I imagine the answer is probably going to be well, haven't seen the river, got to see the river. Yeah. How do you know once you get to the river if you're going to be able to make it all the way down the river? On Yeehaw. the first day or not? <laughs> just, just get that's on what your makes horse it an adventure. And, you know, I was right. gonna say, Jenny, remember, remember we talking, <laughs> talking about that adventure word? Yeah, it's it's honestly I'm it's like the it. part it's the part that I'm like most excited for, and it's the part that I'm most nervous about. I as soon as you get on the fun. yeah, I think so. As soon as you get on the water, see if you can motor up it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll know right away. Can, yeah, you'll know right away. Like you'll automatically start to feel more comfortable, and think, the further you go down, it the more confident you're going to get. I think to reassure that, like if you can go back up the river, like you don't have to worry about anything. And if you can go down the river, like if, if people are going down in canoes, like you guys are going to be fine with this thing. Yeah. And if right. and if people, if you can't fit for whatever reason, or if it's too skinny, like you'll be able to go back up the river. I think. I, right. I'm not worried about it for you. At yeah. All. Yeah. You guys are fairly Seymour? capable problem solvers. I'm perfectly <laughs> confident. Yeah, you've seen us in action. I yeah. <laughs> appreciate that. So, you know, Mark, there's nothing to worry about. We're going to be fine in old 18-foot Hey, we'll elephant. figure it out. Yeah, this is going to be epic. I can't yeah. wait to see yeah. how it If worse comes to worse, you guys can literally live and survive on this for months at a time. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, we've It'll got, make a good shelter. We've yeah. got <laughs> PNW Marine Mark over here. So. Oh, yeah. Furthest yeah. thing from it. Oh, I was born in Washington. I, knew- I know everything about boats. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you're you're. Uh, I knew the term bow and stern, and you've you've uh, embellished this into <laughs> front and back. It's easy. That was very useful insight, though. My only concern is you guys may end, just, end up just killing each other. <laughs> yeah, the, water's, the water's not going to get. At least you have something to eat. It's possible. Yeah. You should have seen us trying to put this dang thing together the other day. There's still blood in the front lot of, from yeah, Mark's breaking Mark's out. Mark's blood is all over the front. I just I, I, first blood in the boat. Well, you had to do it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's all good. What, hey, what? Quick question. What is this? Is that a vacuum cleaner? It's our pump. Or is that a? Oh, that's, that's how you pump, pump it up. Pump. Yep, yep. This pumps the whole thing up. Okay. All eighteen feet of it. Whoa. <laughs> nice. do you have to start that a week in advance. Yep. Uh, yeah, that might be. We might. We, we might should make Eric just blow it up. The instructions. <laughs> he tried that. And he he got a little tired. As man, a little tuckered out. <laughs> As yeah, that's right. <laughs> the instructions, Jim. The instructions, which you. Immediately threw to the wayside. Say Useless. what they say about forty-five minutes an hour to get this thing. That's not terrible. Fully that's ready to rock. Well, yeah, I think that's if you're like highly trained. You know what you're doing, right? This thing's basically a zodiac. 
Yeah. We could put a oh, we should put a mini gun on front of it really. <laughs> and Oh baby, Roll I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't bring that up. Don't bring your attention. Look like, out, squirrels and ducks. We got a minigun. <laughs> slinging, slinging Rick. <laughs> slinging Rick over there is on the old. Oh yeah, I'm down. Bravo. Slinging Rick Whatever. will be on the prowl. I'd, you get weaponry in his hands. I'd be scared to be canoeing on that river. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Imagine the innocent people. Can you picture him with a bandana around his forehead, saying, "If it's brown, it's down." Oh man, is we, that a squatch over there? Boom, boom, yeah. boom. I can picture Look him out. on day four after seeing zero deer in that <laughs> evening. A, a, a deer, deer of any kind walks out <laughs> yeah. within two hundred yards, and yeah. I was going to say, the scary thing is I can picture that. <laughs> yeah. Right. You right. start screaming, look out. <laughs> I was just going to say it. <laughs> look out! Have you seen the size of the eyeballs on Slinging Rick when, some, when one of these things happens? Yeah. Yes. They I, yes. are literally the size of a tennis ball. Yep. And I'm, there's there's no talking his, him out of it. You've heard his breathing yep. when a turkey comes by. Yeah. I'd, yep. I'd never heard any. I was like, this guy is... And which I, I love it. I yeah. love yeah. it. But it's I've great. never seen somebody like... Ready lose to shoot, it, lose I mean, it in such a good way. Yeah. Killer, <laughs> killer instinct, yeah, right there. Yeah, yep. That's but, right. Well, I guess I open this thing, Jim. Should I close her out, or do we need some last calls? Ah, no, I don't. Like I said, we got to keep them on their on their proper timeline. It, we should, you know, guests though always wind up closing out really well. But how about you close it off because we got to leave them on a cliffhanger for what the next one of this Pod Venture series is. But do you guys have any final closing thoughts? Man, I hope you guys document this real well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Film it. Yeah. Pictures like this is going to be, be, really be awesome. Yep. This is sounds like something we need to do that's, at some point. That's the idea. Stay yep. tuned. We'll be doing our best The Hunting Public rendition uh, with with some video stuff along the way uh, on this thing. So Make us proud. Yeah. We'll do our, we'll do our <laughs> best. Excited. We'll do our if, best. If we when make... it's actually out and done, maybe you won't want us to call it our best hunting public rendition. It might <laughs> yeah. be, oh, if that's what they're like, yeah, I'm not going to follow. Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, if you've watched all our videos, we screw up about 98% of the time yep. on literally everything. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, this should be great. All yep. right. Well, I feel better. Marco? Man, uh, thanks for coming, guys. Tons of insight. Always a pleasure having you here. Uh, if we make it out alive, we're definitely going to report back. Uh, as a cliffhanger, we're probably going to chat with our next guest, which probably should have been our first guest or our first step before purchasing the boat, but yeah. we rarely do things in order. If you're looking for a debacle and some good entertainment, tune in to this pod venture. Yes, we're going to discuss actually probably going to see the river and talking to somebody who knows a lot more about it than we do. And figure out if this thing will actually work. There you go. It'll work. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.